Well, welcome YouTube friends and family to the continuing editions of an old fashioned Christmas. So today, what was it like to have Christmas in the 1960s? Stay tuned to find out more. So I thought I would start talking about Christmas in the 60s by sharing a very old photo of my sister and myself sitting on Santa's lap. I'm going to guess this was from about 1965. So this is my older sister, Terry. And of course, this is me sitting on Santa's lap. The frame actually shows a little bit more than what it should, but of course we're wearing our matching velvet jumpers. So this is definitely a precious memory. So I feel like I could be a little bit of an expert on 1960s Christmas because as I've shared many times before, I was born in 1961 and I'll be sharing a little bit about my outfit in a, in a bit here. But before we get started, I wanted to share a website that one of my dear subscribers, Betty, shared with me. Hi, Betty. And it is an amazing website. It is called clickamerica, all one word, dot com. And right now they have 1950s Christmas decor. They have like a slideshow you can look at. It is an amazing website. I actually subscribe. So a big thank you to Betty. I do appreciate you sharing. That was so kind of you. And I've actually looked at it several times. It's just some really beautiful and unique images that I have not seen elsewhere. So I want to also show you one of my vintage finds. So this is a family circle and let's see if I can find where it shows, uh, I guess on the spine here, December, 1961. So this is actually a magazine from my very first Christmas here on this earth. And I have enjoyed every minute of looking at it. So some of the pictures I wanted to share with you, they had directions for how to make jeweled trees and we're going to talk a little bit about decor um, as always uh, pudding was very popular but this is mighty fine not jello pudding they also excuse me for the finger lick they also have lots and lots of cookies which we'll talk about in a moment as well so just reading the ads is such a delight. There are a lot of how-tos, lots of recipes, and even a little Christmas story in here. So definitely one of my treasures. So as soon as Christmas became more commercial and you could buy more of the glittery trappings of the holiday season, people began to long for that simpler time. The 60s, though, were a departure from the 1950s. And if you think back, we had recession, we had a string of traumatic assass assassinations, so think JFK, a war that seemed hopeless and endless, and a generation of youth that was very determined to do everything totally different than their parents. So today I'm going to focus more on the traditional side of the 1960s, not the peace, love, hippie side, because when I grew up, that's the side I remember experiencing. Really the modern hippie type generation really wasn't a part of my life or influence until more like the 70s. So Christmas catalogs, this surprised me, remained strong in spite of the fact that there were many, many department stores. There weren't shopping malls yet, but um, we had paved roads, we had faster cars, but yet people still enjoyed the catalog. So when you think about the 1960s, I will say wife and mother, uh, many times she did work, she, um, Took her kids to music lessons. She was the brownie or Cub Scout leader. She belonged to bridge club. She might be taking flower arranging classes. So the convenience of being able to order from a catalog, even that many years ago, was a convenience that working and even non-working wives and mothers appreciated. 
Sears had been the catalog king for a very long time, but during the 60s, J.C. Penney and Montgomery Ward joined the catalog revolution, if you will. They added wish books in addition to uh, retail store displays, etc. So a lot of times people would go to the store, look at the items, then go home and order it from the wish book. And then kids, and I remember this as well because we certainly had wish books. And I remember JC Penny myself. Um, we would go through and like fold over pages or circle items that we wanted and show our parents, you know, we want Santa to bring us this. Um, so catalogs change from practical and necessities to some pretty extravagant and luxury items. So I want to read a little something to you. And this book I actually purchased on Amazon. I've had it for a while. Mid-Century Christmas, Holiday Fads, Fancies and Fun from 45 to 70. And I have several of these types of books. So Neiman Marcus. Oh dear, don't tell me I've got the wrong. Wait for it. I may have grabbed the wrong book here. Hold on. Yes, here we go. So this one is, uh, it's a wonderful Christmas. So while most catalogs focused on moderately priced items, one catalog became famous for doing just the opposite. The first Neiman Marcus catalog sent in 1926 was an unexceptional 16 page booklet. But when Stanley Marcus, son of the store's co-founder, joined the firm, he decided to do something different. If store windows put the most glittering and most expensive items on display, why shouldn't a catalog do the same? The idea, idea garnered so much publicity that soon Marcus was going out of his way to dream up in, interesting and expensive gifts. In 1959, when backyard barbecuing was all the rage, the featured gift was a black Angus steer accompanied by a silver plated barbecue grill because everybody needed one of those. <laughs> in 65, when the computer age was dawning, the Christmas books cover featured the Honeywell Kitchen computer. At $10,600, it came with a two week course in computer programming and was preloaded with recipes that had to be decoded before they could be put to use. His and her luxury items were added in 1960 with twin Beechcraft airplanes going for just 149,000 and 127,000 respectively. Wealthy couples of 1962 could give each other matching Chinese junks priced at $11,500 each. For ocean enthusiasts, there was 1963's two-person submarine, a bargain at only 18,700. Far less costly were the 1965 pink striped hot air balloons, which sold for a mere $6,850 a piece. So I just thought that was really interesting, a part of the extravagance that seemed to continue into the 1960s. Another fact I was not aware of, did you know Target, that was my shock, Kmart and Walmart all debuted in 1962. So there was a lot of readily available Christmas decorations that were pre-made, you know, a departure from the loving hands at home, homemade type decorations and gifts. A Charlie Brown Christmas actually premiered in 1965, and this was significant for a couple reasons. Of course, the message was the true meaning of Christmas isn't the presents, the glittering holiday trappings. They were really just symbols that represented the real holiday miracle of love and friendship. And if you remember, there was an aluminum tree in part of a Charlie Brown Christmas that was super fancy. I mean, it was stylized. It was just like a triangle, but that kind of ended the popularity, believe it or not, of the aluminum tree, which I still love today and has kind of come back into vogue. There was also a new tradition back in the 60s, and that was the TV Yule Log. 
and this is fascinating to me. The manager of WPIX in New York City realized when a basketball game was canceled, he had nothing to play on Christmas Eve. So he filmed 17 seconds of an actual log burning and ran it on a continuous loop. That tradition, oh, it was shot at Grace Mansion, which was the home of a senator at the time. Oh, mayor, I'm sorry. And it was reshot in 1970. It stopped in 1989, but was brought back by popular demand in 2001. So that's a tradition that started back then that we still hold to today. America also projected much hope in space. I remember very clearly the moon landing in 1969. I was at my cousin's house and we all were on the floor in front of the television like this, just in awe to see actually those first steps being taken on the moon. That was, in 1955, NORAD, which is North America Aerospace Defense, they began tracking Santa. So I am a little bit back in the 50s. And how that came to be, and I failed to mention this in my 1950s video, a child mistake was trying to call Sears, probably for something out of the wish book, right? And dialed wrong and actually got the crew commander at NORAD and the staff ended up mounting a picture of Santa on the tracking uh, radar. And so it became a tradition. And as you know, NORAD still tracks Santa today. Greeting cards of the 1960s were often also space, space related. So I think this is, yes. So I thought this was so cool. Let me try to hold this up so you can see. So this was a card that could be cut out and it was, here comes Santa's spaceship full of cards and toys. How to make your own spaceship. So you could actually punch out or cut out the pieces and make your very own spaceship. So what was the style for Christmas decorating in the 1960s? Well, while mom and dad were still doing the house in mid-century modern, which is really considered 45 to 70. The kids were embracing a look that was truly a century apart. So they were wearing everything from mini skirts one day to granny dresses another. I was not so into that being born in 61, but I do remember those things definitely in the 70s. So some of the trends around decorating had to do with the fact that soft plastics were invented. So instead of just the harder plastic molds, they were able to do artificial trees that were more realistic looking than what the aluminum tree would be, and also artificial flowers and artificial fruit. The colors were still aqua, but became a very cool aqua, and it was often paired with white, which was new for Christmas, silver, and platinum. The madras plaid, if you've ever had any madras um, Bermuda shorts or even a shirt, it became a trendy fashion fabric and it also transferred over then to paper and it was shades of orange, purple, yellow, and chartreuse. And I do remember that from the 60s. The most popular color combination was a bright aqua and a vivid green together. And yes, we had some of that decor in our home. By the late 60s, it had kind of changed to chartreuse green, hot pink, and aqua as well. Kind of glad that went by the wayside. So what was fashion and style like? So I am going to talk about what I'm wearing. So frosting was kind of the name of the game. So that is when highlighting for blondes first came into vogue and they had the frost and tip type hair kits. First it was just hair, then it was lipstick. And if you remember pictures of Twiggy wearing like the white frost lipstick, the white frost nail polish, even cocktail glasses and decorations were frosted. So trees were sprayed with flocking, 
I remember my mom doing that to our tree. Christmas balls had artificial snow and centerpieces had silver leaves in them. So in high style, it was really the look of the 50s continued into the 60s with a little bit less frill and a little more sophistication. So let me share with you here. I've got to pop it up on the iPad. When I was thinking about what to wear today, I wanted to be authentic. So let me open this in Pinterest, giving credit to Pinterest. So here is, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to get this without the, there we go. There is an ad. So you can see, not much unlike the dress that I'm wearing. So simple with a waist cinching belt, still a flared skirt, not as large as what it was in the 50s. I saw lots of pictures like this pretty red dress at the bottom here that had the faux fur trim, the lace top there on the gold. So some really lovely styles. So my dress that I'm wearing today is actually a reproduction of a vintage dress. I told you I have a lot of, I have true vintage and I have a lot of repro too. This is the brooch that I shared in my thrifting video. That was my mom's. I definitely remember her wearing that. So it would have been simple pearls. I can't do a lot of the 50s and 60s hairstyles unless I would put my hair up. But one of the things they did was they put combs in their hair, like pulled back one side of their hair and curls were very popular. So I actually did a wet set <laughs> on my hair last night with the little sponge type sleeping curlers, rolled it up and wore the scarf to bed. And it was actually quite comfortable, just a little overly curly when I first took it out this morning, but maybe this curl will stay better than what? hot curlers stay, right? So there was also going back to decor, an emphasis on centerpieces and then napkin rings were kind of a new thing. The ideal was spare elegance. So think Audrey Hepburn, Jackie Kennedy, less was more. There was a lot of monochromatic trees. And I have to tell you, I remember when my mother did the first monochromatic tree it was blue and it was so disappointing because I liked bubble lights and bright colors and she flocked the tree and she had like a blue garland and these blue satin balls, I'll never forget it. So uh, aluminum trees were popular, as I said, until the mid sixties, then the flocked tree. So that was the first big change. The most common colors of flocking were white, baby blue, and aqua, but there was also pink, and Elvis had a black flocked tree. Who knew, right? The second trend around Christmas decorating was the themed tree, and this was introduced by Jacqueline Kennedy when she developed her all nutcracker tree, and that continued on for many uh, subsequent first ladies finding that uh, thematic tree for the White House. Also common was very small lights, but larger balls all in a single color. Outside was a little different. So the blow molds or the plastic Santas uh, continued in popularity. Now we had Santa and his sleigh and all the reindeer and the candles that were four foot tall, like, a, like we had with the dripping wax. Plastic holly, plastic wreaths, and I mentioned earlier with the soft plastic, plastic fruit. So this created a fad for Della Robia decor inside and outside. So greenery was often studded with this faux fruit, like apples, grapes, lemons, oranges, and pears. Other items that you might remember, Santa mugs with the Noel handles. I have a set of those. Four foot electric candles, like I mentioned earlier. Now this 
would not have been something I was aware of in the 60s, but that's when Christmas underclothes became very popular. So undershorts were made for Dan, Dad that had Santa and holiday bells. And for Mom, she had jingle bell panties with real bells. That sounds extremely uncomfortable to me, but hey, it was a fad in the 60s. So what were gifts like? Well, families continued to buy those large family gifts like color TVs and boats and campers, something that all of the family members could use. And also Disney trips became very popular. Gift cards like we have today didn't exist, but department stores set up stag shops. So a lady could go in, create a Christmas wish list, and then her spouse could go in, dad could go in, ask for her wish list to be pulled, and then he could just shop directly from that. Some other novelty gifts included troll dolls, had one, mood rings, had one, lava lamps, love beads, anything with a peace symbol, tie-dye t-shirts, and fallout shelter handbooks. So there was still, after the issue with um, the war, there was still some fear of bombing radiation. So people were um, anxious to receive books that told how to build and supply their own fallout shelter. So this is gonna make you feel a little old. My apologies, guys. Got a phone call that interrupted my videoing. So back to toys that may make you feel your age. So Barbie came out in 59, but she really boomed in the 60s. So that's when all of the accessories came, her dream house. Uh, actually, the thing that I wanted so bad that I didn't get was Kenner's Easy Bake Oven. And when they first came out, they were teal and they evolved through, you know, many different colors. But who would have ever thought you could cook a cake with a light bulb? My best friend who lived next door, her name was Kimmy. <laughs> she got an Easy Bake Oven. So I did at least get to bake in the Easy Bake Oven. But for whatever reason, my parents thought it was unnecessary. For boys, there were wind-up robots, three-stage rockets, and here comes G.I. Joe as well. Some of the games, which I still have my original games, are the Game of Life, still have it, Rock'em Sock'em Robots, which my neighbor Kimmy also got and I didn't, Mousetrap, Operation, still have it, to remember the game Twister, that was a 60s thing, Etch-a-Sketch, which I did have, the snow cone machines, so it was like a snowman and his stomach is where the ice crushed up and came out of and then you put the syrup in it. And Hot Wheels, and I also found this very interesting. Legos were first introduced in 1962. So if you've ever stepped on a Lego, like all my life I've been dealing with stepping on Legos. My son loved them as well. So I wanted to share with you some costs like I did in the 1950s video. I won't read the entire list. Again, this comes from Christmas Memories. So a 27 inch wide roll of wrapping paper was 94 cents, 620 in today's money. A 50 light strand, pardon me, of miniature lights, $3.29, which would be 22.70. So they were still quite pricey. A six foot tall aluminum tree was $11.29, $77.90 in today's money. Uh, yeah, aluminum trees from that time period, as I've shared, it depends on the type that you buy. You won't find one for less than $200, but anything in good condition can be five to eight hundred. Uh, a lawn Santa that was lit from within and 42 inches tall was $16.50, $108.55. So you can see that people were really spending money on their decor. Land Lakes butter was 49 cents a pound, 330 in today's money. 
not that far off of what it is. A six pack of candy canes was 25 cents, $1.80 in today's money. A GE dishwasher was $149.95. In today's money, that would be $1,071. So again, extravagant gifts. An RCA color TV was $358.88. $2,424.90 in today's money. So these were some of the family gifts and you can see they were quite pricey on the 1960s budget. A ping pong table, five feet by nine feet was $19.95 or $142.50 in today's uh, money. An easy bake oven with the mixes was $8.99. So in today's money, that was fifty nine fifteen. So that may, pardon me, explain a little bit why I never got an easy bake oven. A Viewmaster with three Batman reels was two seventy eight or eighteen thirty today. A Tiger guitar with an amplifier was nineteen eighty eight or one hundred thirty dollars eighty cents in today's money. So lots of fun memories of the nineteen sixties for sure. The last thing I want to speak about is eat till it hurts. So I have a Better Homes and Gardens vintage cookbook. I believe it's 66 or 69. 69. And it has a whole section on Christmas. So here is one of the things that it shows. And it's probably easier to see here on the back. Look at all of the cookies. So cookies were very popular. So sugar cookies that were cut out with sprinkles and the little silver balls that made you think you were going to break your teeth. Popular shapes were bells, bows, reindeers, toys. And there was an annual holiday cooking section as a major feature in Better Homes and Gardens, Good Housekeeping, Women's Day, and McCall's. And as I showed you in the family circle, it was also in the 1961 family circle. Because of metal shortages during the war, cookie cutters switched to being plastic, but they were problematic because they didn't cut clean because they were not sharp enough. So in comes the drop cookie. So a drop cookie was something you would have perhaps put colorful candied fruit or nuts in, you dip it on a spoon, scrape it off onto the cookie sheet in a blob, and it cooked in the blob. That's a very attractive way to describe it. But some, some examples of that are like Santa's whiskers. And then do you remember the stained glass windows where you would crush up hard candies? They would melt and be like the center part of the cookie. Then in the 50s came the cookie press. So today we are going to be using my personal vintage Miro cookie press. And I'm going to share with you a recipe that was popular in the 60s. So stay tuned. So in honor of our 1960s Christmas, I thought I would break out my Miro cookie and pastry press. And if you notice cookie, is spelled C-O-O-K-Y. I purchased this actually a while back on eBay, so I'm not sure of the year. I tried to do a little research, couldn't really find the year other than just saying 50s. It is made by Miro Aluminum in Wisconsin, like much of the aluminum trees were as well. But this actually has the original recipe book and you can make um, eclairs you can pipe frosting with this one too on the back of the box the box is sort of a a green it's not really aqua it advertises their cookie sheets as well and um, let me show you what the cookie press looks like not that much different than what you buy today except that it's aluminum so this is where you put your dough you can see ooh, i'm doing a bad job there i've put the Wow, it's hard to do this backwards. I've put the Christmas tree in. You put your dough in, screw the lid on, turn this, and it forces the dough through in shapes. And then you can actually color the dough. I don't plan to do that. This particular set came with all of the little discs, everything from 
uh, I remember these little swirls, the Christmas tree, it has a clover, it has a camel, which I thought was really kind of cool, um, clover, not even sure, butterfly, um, I think that is supposed to be a dog, and then of course the three icing tips. So we are going to give it a try, guys, <laughs> and see how successful I can be at making this work. So well, let me swing you around here. Oops, and I need my recipe book. Hang on. So I have my oven preheated to 375, and I'm going to use the recipe for quick mix spritz. Say that three times fast. So what I've done in preparation is I have sifted together after measuring two and a quarter cups flour, three quarter cups sugar, one quarter teaspoon baking powder, one half teaspoon of salt. So you sift that together. To that, you cut in one cup of shortening. Now, <laughs> I have to share with you all, I cannot use vegetable shortening because it's made from soybean oil. So I am going to be using lard today which should have the same taste and I pray the same outcome. So you could do this part by hand and it actually gives directions by hand, but when you have a mixer, maybe I should drop that down so I'm not putting all the shortening right on the, or I'm sorry, the lard right on the mixer head. So I'm gonna put that in and you wanna whirl that together until fat, we'll call it fat, is mixed into flour and resembles coarse crumbs. So let me swing you down here and I'm just going to turn it on low and kind of add this a little bit at a time. And I'm sure I'm going to have to do some scraping because this is not a huge volume recipe. For sure. I'm also wearing my thrift store apron that washed beautifully. I don't have a date on this. I would say it's probably 60s to 70s. I don't think it's 50s based on the color. I'm sure you've all seen a mixer go round and round. So I am going to get this incorporated and then I will bring you back and show you what the next steps are. So that was very easy to incorporate. So the next step is to crack your egg into a measuring cup. And it says a large egg will measure one quarter cup. If it does not, add water to the one quarter cup line. And I will tell you, I had to add water. So we're just going to plop that in. And what I do know about the cookie press from both experience uh, from childhood as well as watching other YouTubers use a cookie press is the moisture level is super critical. So if it's too wet, you'll have to add some flour. If it's too dry, um, add some, a little bit of water. And for that reason, I am going to measure my vanilla, which I normally would not. So it's one teaspoon of vanilla extract. Ooh, smells really, really good, guys. It's all stuck, as you see, to, <laughs> to the beater. So let me let me poke, poke that off and um, make sure it looks well incorporated. It actually does. And if so, we will load our cookie press. Uh, I see it a little bit. Maybe mix it one more time. And we'll give it a try. You know, I would say if you don't have a cookie press, this would make a lovely rolled cookie. 
um, as well. And the baking instructions are, are 375, 10 to 12 minutes. The other thing I know is do not overbake these. So one more roll around. Okay, I'm gonna call that good. And as y'all know, sometimes I have trouble with this. <laughs> there we go. I'm just gonna take it off of the beater. You definitely don't want it chilled because then it becomes too stiff. I'm just hoping that the consistency of lard doesn't cause a problem for us. But there's no point in me making it with vegetable shortening because then I can't eat it. <laughs> And I at least want to be able to eat it. Okay. Let me kind of clear this area here a little bit. Now you want to press these out directly onto your cookie sheet. And it says ungreased. And that's just my oven letting me know it's ready. And one of the things I can see right away is because you have to put the, the disc in from the inside, everything that we make today is going to be a tree. Now my hands are clean, but I am going to press this all in. I suppose, you know what? I suppose we could just do like half and at least see how it's gonna come out. And I've unscrewed the actual press portion, which is this, all the way out. And now I'm going to just turn it until it meets resistance and I can see that it's pressing the dough against the tree. I can remember my mom actually putting food color in this. So you can see this has like little legs here. So you just turn it, lift. Ooh, that might be a little much, Kim. Well, this is interesting. Okay, that one's better. So learn as you go, this dough is a dream to work with. Not bad at all. Yeah, I think the first couple I made are too fat. So what I'm gonna do, because I want them all to bake evenly, is I will redo those. So basically, as soon as you meet uh, resistance, <laughs> okay, here comes the frustration part. You wanna go ahead and pull straight up. Oh. There we go, we are coming along here. Now, are they perfect? No, but they are definitely spritz cookies. That's why I remember them being. Oh, this is super fun. That one's too fat. <laughs> what I remember my mom having trouble with was she couldn't get the dough to come out and I am like overturning this. So let me pay attention here. There we go. You can actually kind of watch it. Okay. Now you can decorate these with your sprinkles, etc. And I'm gonna put them in a 375 oven. I'm gonna check it at 10 minutes. I know that these don't get tremendously brown, so let me decorate them up, stick them in the oven, and I will bring you back in a moment. Well, our cookies just turned out beautifully, and what better time than to eat off of some of my mid-century modern plates, but the proof is in the taste. So here's what the little stars look like. Mmm. Definitely a vanilla shortbread cookie, not low in calories or fat, but very delicious. 
and I ended up with quite a few cookies. So I hope you've enjoyed today's nod to the 60s and trying out one of my little vintage appliances. I will be back, of course, next week with lots of new content, have a lot of good ideas of things I'd like to share with you. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified, and share the video if you know someone who would be interested in the content. Still working on growing my channel. So as always, be healthy, be well, be blessed, and I'll see y'all very soon. Take care.